Good morning, and thank you for joining us this morning, the second Sunday of Easter. Before we begin, a few announcements. The first is starting next Thursday, so April 22nd, we have a new book study called What If Jesus Was Serious? There are illustrations that accompany this book study that will be sent out in the announcements every week, but starting April 22nd via Zoom at either 10 a.m. or 7 p.m., I invite you to join me as we discuss these things Jesus taught us during the Sermon on the Mount and what they mean and what this world would look like if we actually took them fully seriously. So that's the first announcement. The second is you probably saw in your email yesterday, or if you haven't, I hope you'll check after the service, we've relaunched our Trinity today. Um, it's, so it's in your mailbox. We're doing something completely new with it going forward. Two of our vestry members, Suzanne Oswald and David Harvey, have stepped up and are revamping it, and it is going to be glorious. So I invite you to check that out. And we're going to be needing some contributions monthly. So I hope you'll look and see if there's anything you feel that you might be called to contribute. The third announcement is today, you're going to notice something. You're going to notice that a lot of the music is mighty familiar to what we heard last week. This is because this morning, our music director, John, and I had a discussion, and with the rising numbers of COVID and the variants, we didn't feel it in our best interest or your best interest or our choral scholars' best interest to continue gathering as we have for these live services. Even though we are technically allowed, we just feel for the health of those we loved, it's safer for us right now not to. We made this decision right before the service, so some of the songs will be songs that we heard last week and that were recorded. However, we discovered something really neat. Well, John discovered something really neat this morning, and for our offertory hymn, he pre-recorded the organ before service, and he's going to sing live with the pre-recorded organ for the offertory. So knowing we can do that opens up the whole realm of possibilities. So we hope you understand why there's a repeat in music. It's just to keep everyone safe because we love each other, we love you, and we just, we want to help be part of the solution here. With that said, I invite you to join in as we sing our opening hymn. Mm -hmm.
the collect of the day. Risen Christ, for whom no, no door is locked, no interest, entrance barred, open the doors of our hearts so that we may seek the good of others and to walk the joyful road of sacrifice and peace. To the praise of God, the source of all life. Amen. After Jesus died and God made him alive again, the disciples continued to meet. They gathered on the first day of the week, on Sunday. They were very happy because last week they had seen Jesus alive in this very room. Jesus said to them, peace be with you. And just as God sent me, I now send you to do and say all of the things that I have said. And then he breathed the Holy Spirit on them. But Thomas had not been there. And Thomas said, until I see the scars on his hands, and I put my hand in Jesus' side, I will not believe that he is alive. And Thomas joined them at the table and they closed the doors. And suddenly someone appeared. Peace be with you. Thomas, put your hands in my side and see my scars. Do not doubt anymore, but believe. And Thomas said, my Lord, my God. Jesus said, Thomas, you believe because you have seen. Blessed are those who believe without seeing. I wonder why Thomas needed to see Jesus in order to believe. I wonder why listening to the other disciples wasn't enough. I wonder where you would be in this story. I wonder what the most important part of this story is. I wonder if you will recognize this story in our gospel reading today. The first reading is from the book of Acts. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, so rest he John 
chapter 1. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This life was revealed, and we have seen it and testify to it, and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. We declare to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not know what is true. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The Word of the Lord. Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. 
But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. This is the Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. of all our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight O Lord our strength and our Redeemer amen well it's Thomas's week to be front and center in our gospel this morning and I'm sure we've all heard this story in fact I'm sure most of us know the nickname Thomas has be has that Thomas has because of this story the nickname Thomas has been called from behind pulpits hollered out in sermons labeled as, in some biblical translations, Thomas, Doubting Thomas. Oh, poor Thomas. We've heard it said, don't be like Thomas. We've heard it said, Thomas didn't even truly believe until he saw. We've heard it said, be like the other ten. They didn't need the proof that Thomas did. In fact, I've heard these sentences said so many times, that when I first read the scripture this week, my immediate thought was, oh, it's Thomas. Here we go again. Time to preach the whole believing is seeing sermon again. The sermon that tells us who not to be like. That sermon that weirdly tells us not to be like one of Jesus' followers. You know, not to be human with questions and concerns and yes, even doubts. Then I slowly read the passage. Then I really stopped, and I paid attention to the words. My natural tendency when reading most scriptures is to focus on the parts that I really know well, the parts that I heard the most growing up, the parts I know have been written about ad nauseum. This morning's gospel was and is no different. I always want to jump to that part of our gospel that says, but Thomas said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. But this week, I think we need to back it up a bit. At least I know I had to back it up a bit and really read and hear what the scripture was saying. My brain this week was focused on how Thomas keeps getting a bad reputation and maybe we should see if he actually deserves it. Because being called a doubter hurts. People questioning our faith hurts. It leads to feelings of exclusion, to feelings of being judged, to pain, heartbreak, and sometimes it results in us getting lost in our own thoughts, in our own life, and getting lost in our own spiritual journey. So for Thomas's sake, and for ours, let's back it up a bit. John 20, verses 19 and 20. The verses we started with this morning read, When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After Jesus said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Then, then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. They didn't truly see the Lord until his wounds were shown to them. They didn't rejoice until they saw his hands and they saw his side. They didn't believe until Jesus proved it to them, proved that it was him. So what we have here are ten disciples who, judging by the words used, were quite possibly just as skeptical as Thomas was. So my brain kept thinking. How is it okay for a whole group to be skeptical, but poor Thomas, lonely, solo Thomas? The group, all ten of them can be skeptical, but yet we pick on Thomas. Spending time this week thinking, thinking about how we read scripture, 
and thinking about the preconceived notions that being in a group versus being alone carries with it really had me thinking. When a whole group engages in a specific behavior, well then, it's just acceptable behavior most times. Totally fine, in fact, nothing to see here, nothing to talk about. After all, it seems that the whole group adheres to this behavior, so surely it must be acceptable, it must be proper, it must be okay. But then, when there is one person who engages in the same specific behavior, but does it separate from the crowd, how happy are we to judge that person's solo behavior, criticize the behavior, attach labels to this individual? Because surely, if you're doing something outside of the group, alone by yourself, it must be wrong. It can't be proper. It must be a character flaw, right? We see this so often in society, in our world, on news, on television shows, everywhere. If you're not there, or you miss something big, or the chance to participate in something big, you're excluded from the group. You're judged, you're singled out and labeled. If you aren't with the original crew, if you're not there, if you miss the event, mess up the time, show up late, you're not part of the in-group. And well, we all want to be part of the in-group. And there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, humans are chemically programmed in our brains to crave acceptance and a feeling of belonging. We don't always crave people and groups to be physically with, but we do crave fellowship. We want to belong somewhere. We want to have membership somewhere. We want to know we have a place. I wonder if Thomas felt this way that one week, felt he was without membership. I wonder if the focus on how Thomas doubted and needed proof was just a result of Thomas constantly having this awesome, amazing event Jesus coming and standing before the ten, thrown in his face repeatedly. Hearing about it nonstop while they ate, while they worked. It was probably the only topic of conversation, because let's be honest, we'd do the same thing. If we were present and witnessed such an amazing event, well, I can't talk for all of you, but I know I'd be talking about it nonstop. It would have been such an honor, such a gift. Such a blessing to witness. But Thomas didn't get to witness it. Thomas wasn't physically present to receive the blessing Jesus bestowed. Thomas wasn't there. And we don't know why Thomas wasn't there. What we do know is that they were all hiding out up in that room because they were afraid of what the public would do to Jesus' followers. But Thomas wasn't there. Thomas wasn't locked behind those doors, and we don't know why. Which got me wondering, what would pull Thomas away from the group? It was the first day of the week, the day Jesus appeared to Mary Magdalene, to other women, and to the ten in the room. The disciples, the whole group, were already hiding out in the room from other people, from the world. So why was Thomas already separated from the group? Maybe. Just maybe, Thomas was the youngest, and as the youngest was sent out to collect groceries for the group's long stay cooped up in that room, maybe Thomas had the least seniority in the group and was sent out on a grunt work session. Maybe Thomas was the bodybuilder among them and he could defend himself against attacks from others, so he was the only one confident enough to not be locked behind a door. Maybe. Maybe Thomas, often called the twin, wasn't as well known by the community, by the people, and could get away with being in public without fear of violence, without fear of being noticed. Maybe, just maybe, Thomas was the only one who wasn't afraid of being seen in public, of being called out for being one of Jesus' followers, and therefore went out to get what they needed. Maybe Thomas was busy serving, getting what the group needed to survive, and that's why he wasn't in that room the first time Jesus appeared. Because there's another fact that we often forget to chat about and to mention and to think about. Never once does Jesus ask, hey, you're all here, where's Thomas? Thomas's absence didn't affect whether Jesus showed up for the 10. So Jesus showed up, but Thomas wasn't there. I wonder if this made Thomas feel like an outsider with the group. 
made him feel like he was on the outer fringe, made Thomas feel like he was excluded. And I wonder, what if Jesus coming back a week later wasn't just so that we could preach about how it's better to believe than to see, but was also so that Thomas would be brought back into fellowship with the entire group. Thomas spent the entire week hearing about this miraculous event, hearing about what happened, and no doubt hearing and seeing countless reenactments of how the event all played out. So maybe Thomas, having his own experience, Thomas being able to see and touch Jesus, brought him back into full fellowship with his crew. Just things I've been wondering about this week. Because we know when Jesus comes back a week later, Thomas isn't alone. Thomas and the ten are all there together. So this visit, this Jesus showing up, gave them all a shared experience, a common event, a shared miracle, a bonding experience. Thomas was brought back into the group. Thomas was brought back into fellowship, shared faith, shared experiences. And then we have the statement that normally gets preached about today. But that now, the more that I think about how the ten got to witness Jesus before they rejoiced, and how Thomas got to personally touch Jesus, that the words, blessed are those who have seen and yet have come to believe, are words meant for all of us. Because we've all been the group, and we've all been Thomas. We are still the group and Thomas mixed together every single day. Our faith is proven to us daily. I see my faith, the reason for my belief in the eyes of children, in the helping hands of volunteers, in the precision and dedicated work of healthcare workers, in the care given to each other. We see this in the love of God which shines forth from each and every one of us, that shines through each and every person we meet. This love is a new creation. This love is why we have Easter. This love is what holds Thomas and the disciples together. This fellowship, this community, this family, this faith, this love. So this new creation, knowing because we have seen the work of Jesus Christ here on earth, knowing that our God is our life, our love, and our very breath, how are we going to take our faith, the good news of Jesus Christ, out into the world and live into this new Easter creation. Because one thing is for sure, we can't hide ourselves up in the locked room. We can't be afraid of being who we are, believing in our God, and we can't hide our faith out of fear of judgment. God has given us a gift. New creation is that gift. And what is a new creation, a new life, if it's held away from other people, away from love, and away from light. Let's join together. Let's share what we know. Let's share what we believe. And let's also know and respect that just because other people haven't seen the love of God proven to them in this very world in the way in which we have, that doesn't make them doubters. And most definitely doesn't exclude them from the love of new creation. The Lord, after all, is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Together, let us confess our faith as we say, We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, 
who proceeds from the Father. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, as we bring our hopes and desires, our fears and despair before the throne of grace, let us speak with one voice. Here in my home, I will say, Lord, in your mercy, and collectively, either aloud or in your heart space, respond with, hear our prayer. Oh God, your son remained with his disciples after his resurrection, teaching them to love all people as neighbors. As his disciples in this age, we offer you prayers on behalf of the universe in which we are privileged to live and our neighbors with whom we share it. God of love, lifting up your world for all humankind, breathe love to the world to heal it. Fall like spring rains upon your faithful people despite our distractions and divisions and heal our cramped and sometimes cruel hearts that we might serve you better. Come into all parts of our lives, our secret upper rooms and our dark private Gethsemanes that we may be given new eyes to recognize you and know with full certainty that you have gone before, blessed by the wounds of your body given for us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of strength, even as we long to understand that which is often beyond our comprehension, we lay before you the hearts, minds, and bodies of all those suffering conflicts, both within and without. We pray for the unemployed and the confused, the brokenhearted and the homeless, the helpless, the frontline workers and their families. We pray for healthcare providers and politicians, for school children and teachers. We pray for young people everywhere, that when the regular signposts of life fall away and are deemed unstable, they might find solidity and steadfastness in your bountiful love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of the nations, give to all people the blessing of well-being, freedom and harmony, and above all things, give us faith in you that we may be strengthened to care for those in need. We remember the conflicts of the world. We pray for peace in Myanmar, for calm and clarity amid the Zimbabwe pro-democracy movement. We pray for unity and right governance in the Middle East. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Father, we pray for ourselves. Without our different communities and social groups with splintered families and fractured friendships, many of us feel bereft and alone. Help us to discover unity and truth in study and prayer. And as we open to your word, pour out your spirit that we might not just survive, but thrive and flourish in the season of lightened days and new growth. Help us to persevere, to stretch and turn towards you, that we might stand at the end of time as a true testimony to your love. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. In this community of Edmonton, we pray for all the people who occupy this land, for your first peoples, for settlers, refugees, and newcomers. We are grateful for this diverse and life-giving planet, and we ask your guidance in stewardship and nurturing of our wilderness and wetlands, our life-sustaining boreal forest, and our broad and beautiful prairies. We pray for each other as a true communion, and we ask your blessing and bounty on the Diocese of Saskatchewan, the Right Reverend Michael Hawkins Bishop. We pray for their diocesan Indigenous Bishop, Right Reverend Adam, Adam Halkett, Bishop of Missinippi, and the Right Reverend Isaiah Larry Beardley, Assisting Bishop of Missinippi. 
We pray for the Church of St. Matthew in Viking and their inter-ministry. We ask a special blessing on two retired pastors of Bouye, Joel Manami and Osi Niyabesi. We also pray for Paul First Nation. In our history and yearnings, in our hopes and aspirations, we pray, Father, for gracious, generous, and honoring coexistence with the people who saw fit to share this land. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father of goodness, you have given us much here at Holy Trinity, and much is required. Help us to work towards your kingdom in the ministries and outreach work that continues from this place. Bless the leadership and volunteers with right thinking and open hearts that we might be, again, a testimony to your love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Today we remember those who suffer in mind, body, and spirit. We pray, great healer, for Roger and Ed. We pray for Father Allen and Gertrude, Margaretha, Natalie. We pray for Hannah and Dorothy, for Jean, for Harry, for Andrew, for Jenny and Hughes and Laura. We remember Raymond and Ruth. We pray for Lori, David, Bill, Bob. We pray for Julia, Graham, Jan, and Bob F. And we pray for those we hold in the silence of our hearts. Be a light unto those in darkness. Wrap them in gentle love. Restore those who you would restore and comfort those who mourn. We pray for the dead. And on this day, we remember your servant, the Duke of Edinburgh, Prince Philip. May his service and duty be rewarded and light perpetual shine upon him. Comfort Her Royal Highness Queen Elizabeth II as she grieves the loss of her husband and companion. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Creator of the whole world, we marvel that you care for us and you know all longings of each secret heart. Open these same hearts to your power, moving around us and between us and within us, until your glory is revealed in our love of both friend and enemy, in communities transformed by love, by justice, and by compassion, and in the healing of all that is broken. We ask these things in the name of your Son, our Shepherd, Jesus Christ. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And And also with you.
You have freed us from our sins and made us a kingdom in your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Accept all we offer you this day, and strengthen us in the new life you have given us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right to glorify you, Creator, and to give you thanks. For you alone are God, living and true, dwelling in light inaccessible from before time and forever. Fountain of life and source of all goodness, you made all things and filled them with your blessing. You created them to rejoice in the splendor of your radiance. Countless throngs of angels stand before you to serve you night and day, and beholding your presence, they offer you unceasing praise. Joining with them and giving voice to every creature under heaven, we acclaim you and glorify your name as we sing. reveal your wisdom and love. You formed us in your own image, giving the whole world into our care, so that in obedience to you, our Creator, we might rule and serve all your creatures. When our disobedience took us far from you, you did not abandon us to the power of death. In your mercy, you came to our help, so that in seeking you, we might find you. Again and again you called us into covenant with you, and through the prophets you taught us to hope for salvation. O oh God, you loved the world so much that in the fullness of time you sent your only Son to be our Savior. Incarnate by the Virgin Mary, he lived and died as one of us, yet without sin. To the poor he proclaimed the good news of salvation, to prisoners, freedom, to the sorrowful, joy. To fulfill your purpose, 
He gave himself up to death, and rising from the grave, destroyed death and made the whole creation new, and that we might no longer live for ourselves, but live for him who died and rose for us. He sent the Holy Spirit, his own first gift, for those who believe, to complete his work in the world, and to bring to fulfillment the sanctification of all. When the hour had come for him to be glorified by you, his heavenly Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved his own who were in the world, and he loved them to the end. At supper with them he took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Creator, we now celebrate the memorial of our redemption, recalling Christ's death and descent among the dead, proclaiming his resurrection and ascension to your right hand, awaiting his coming in glory, and offering to you, from the gifts you have given us, this bread and this cup. We praise you and we bless you. We praise you, you, we bless you, you. we give give thanks thanks to you, and we pray to you, Lord our God. O God, we pray that in your goodness and mercy, your Holy Spirit may descend among us and upon these gifts, sanctifying them and showing them to be holy gifts for your holy people, the bread of life and the cup of salvation, the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Grant that all who share this bread and this cup may become one body and one spirit, a living sacrifice in Christ to the praise of your name. Remember, Lord, your one holy Catholic and apostolic church, redeemed by the blood of your Christ. Reveal its unity, guard its faith, and preserve it in peace. And grant that we may find our inheritance with all the saints who have found favor with you in ages past. We praise you in union with them and give you glory through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, all honor and glory are yours, almighty God, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, forever and ever. Lord, we died with you on the cross. 
Now we are raised to new life. We were buried in your tomb. Now we share in your resurrection. Live in us that we may live in you. These are the gifts of God for you, the people of God. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you, the Lord keep you, the Lord always turn the Lord's face to shine upon you and be gracious to you all the days of your life. And the blessing of God our Father, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest upon you and remain with you today and always. Amen. Amen. Let us pray the prayer after communion. Creator, we have seen with our eyes and touched with our hands the bread of life. Strengthen our faith that we may grow in love for you and for each other. Through Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. Amen. Amen. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation in the Church and in Christ Jesus, forever and ever. Amen. May Almighty God, who has redeemed us and made us God's children through the resurrection of Jesus our Lord, bestow upon you the riches of God's blessing. May God, who through the water of baptism has raised us up from sin into newness of life, make you holy and worthy to be united with Christ forever. May God, who has brought us out of bondage to sin into truth and lasting freedom in the Redeemer, bring you to your eternal inheritance. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you forever. Amen.
forth into the world, rejoicing in the power of the risen Lord. Alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. 